Greetings all of Trinidad and Tobago, those of you who are at home, those of you who are abroad, wherever you might be. Thank you very much for paying attention to our short notice press conference, which will also be a short event. I, or we are here in Tobago and um, taking the opportunity to speak very quickly and rather urgently with the population of Trinidad and Tobago. So I'm glad that you have been able to be informed and paying attention. Let me begin by taking this opportunity to thank all the people of Trinidad and Tobago and elsewhere who have been concerned about my well-being during the last days of this month. I have been in Tobago for the last month. And during that period, I became a victim of COVID-19, and I have had to follow all the regulations and the protocols that apply to a person who has been tested positive. And thankfully, I have been able to overcome that without too much dislocation. And I, on the last Tuesday, had completed my extended stay in isolation. So I'm very happy to be out and about. And I, for those who are concerned, I know mo many people were, I am not feeling any of the, any the worse for them. But I must say that I have been one of the lucky ones. I do know of very, very many people who have had far worse circumstances. So I do consider myself very lucky. And I will go further to say that for those of you who did in fact send your prayers and made your prayers that we can all say that our prayers have been answered. And on behalf of my family, my constituency, the cabinet, and the people of Trinidad and Tobago, I want to just give thanks. Secondly, as you know, while I was here, I kept my engagements and I kept engaged with the day-to-day -day operations of the government. And one of those engagements is this morning I met with the health department, the health team, the national security team, and the Office of the Prime Minister, and we reviewed the situation in Trinidad and Tobago with respect to the escalation of incidents of COVID infections. You would have been hearing the numbers for the last few days. I can tell you that today's number, at the last time I was informed, and the day still has, well, I guess that's the, the figure they'll use for the last period of um, attention is 328. And I want you to take that in the context of the days when we were reporting single digits or early teens. And very quickly, we've moved from that to reporting hundreds of in confirmed infected persons. Because while these numbers do not represent yesterday's figure, because it's usually a, a, an accumulation of a period before. It does indicate only a portion of the infection in the country. These are the confirmed infections as from persons who have been sought out through contact tracing or who brought themselves forward as a result of symptomatic observations. There must be very many other persons out there who are asymptomatic and are positive or are confining themselves to home without the intervention of the health department. Because one of the restrictions you, we have is if you feel ill, stay home. If you do that, you'll be helping the situation. But if you do stay home, and just stay home and not be recorded by the health department that incidence would not be part of the statistics that we're having. But seeing the confirmations growing as alarmingly as they have been growing, we can only come to one conclusion. And that conclusion is that the level of infection in Trinidad and Tobago is reaching disturbing heights. Every day we discuss this matter with the health department experts, there's one particular um, statistical expression that we pay attention to, and that is the projected curve, the, 
the, the line that shows where you are likely to be if you allow this rate to continue uninterrupted. And that curve, when I did address the country um, not too long ago, we indicated that we had to act because the curve was taking us up a slope that would be disastrous if interventions were not made. So uh, not too long ago, we did make some interventions with the expectation that we would be suppressing that curve and not arrive at a place of national disaster. I can tell you that the, the numbers that we are reading now, we are seeing now, are slightly ahead of the projected numbers that we would have made in some quarters and in some other quarters um, we would see the curve not going in the direction that we'd like it to go. But taking the raw number, 328 as against 250 as against 180 as against 15, you don't have to be Einstein to understand what we're dealing with. But ladies and gentlemen, the most important thing that we have to understand and not lose sight of is that at this time in our lives, we, the people of the world, the people of the country, those who are fortunate to be alive, and especially those who are not ill and requiring attention, we are existing in a pandemic. So all the ramifications and the fallouts from what we are doing, they make good stories, some of them quite painful, but they are responses to a situation over which we do not have the kind of control we'd like to have. And we have to see it and take it in the context that this is the best of a bad situation. Because as bad as it is, as we make these interventions, if we do not make interventions to interrupt the spread and allow that curve to climb and the infection level in the country to be of such a nature that we begin to feel the effects, the full effects of a pandemic, which you see in some countries, you get the news every day. And what are those effects? The effects as reflected in numbers are a large number of very sick people who would require medical attention, medical attention coming under stress and not being available, persons dying from not getting the kind of attention that is required by the ailment that they are facing, and of course, persons being very sick and not being able to function, and worse, those categories of unfortunate people spreading that wider and wider in the population. In Trinidad and Tobago, in anticipation of being anywhere near that kind of outcome, on the pathway that we have been since January 2020, we took the following position. One, that we will resist the spread of the virus, and two, that we will set about to ensure that persons who are unfortunate enough to be infected and require medical attention, that that medical attention would be available. <clears throat> to do that, we had to operate a system of quarantine. Initially, it was all state-sponsored quarantine. Then later on, as we got a better understanding of the virus and how we can relate to it and not increase our risk, we, we expanded the state control quarantine to state institutional quarantine to quarantine in other areas under state control. And eventually we got to um, home quarantine in some instances, and depending on, and we loosened the grip of the virus upon us. And in fact, the best that we had been in this situation was in the month of February. Interestingly enough, everybody was afraid of carnival. But once the decision was made that there'll be no carnival, and we intervened to keep crowds from accumulating and propagation of the virus from happening, the numbers in February were relatively low. It didn't take us long to see those numbers climb upwards because the numbers will climb depending on the level of infection. And the level of infection will climb 
depending on the behavior of the population. Last Christmas, before Christmas, I said to you that we are going into Christmas and New Year's. If we behave well, when we come out, one of the things we were aiming to do was to get some children out of school. We did that. Fortunately, the numbers were good enough to allow us to do that, and those senior children were out to school. We did say that we're going into a period of vacation similarly over Easter, and if we get numbers that we can live with without interventions, we will want to bring out some of our primary school children in mid-April. We were not able to do that because by the time we came out of Easter, we had the interventions of the arrival of vaccines. And I could tell you as a person who has been monitoring this on a daily basis, I saw the relaxation when the vaccines were authorized, when the vaccines started to be distributed, and even though the vaccines were available in small numbers, the general conversation, the general reaction of the population was to let our guard down because vaccines are available and vaccination was coming and vaccination will save us. And of course, we were saying that is not so because the vaccine is not a cure. All the vaccine does is to prepare your body to be better able to fight the virus if and when you are infected. But even after you're vaccinated, you may still find that it's possible to get the virus and, of course, transmit it. So it was a relief that was desperately needed, and people took that relief. The vaccine season caused us to lose sight of the fact that it was not a cure, Vaccines weren't even available, still aren't available. As head of a government of an independent country, I could tell you we cannot buy a single vaccine anywhere in the world. And all those who would like to help by getting vaccines for us, they are in no better position because the vaccines are in the possession of people who have decided that they will use it for themselves and only when they are satisfied that they have been vaccinated, then they would look in our direction. That is a fact. So anything else you're hearing from anybody, unless they want to vaccinate you with salt water or any other product, the bottom line is vaccines are not available. Even what was available by commitment, by contracted arrangements, are not available because the suppliers have been literally dominated and controlled by a very few people. And what is worse, the simple matter you would have heard last week, that the Americans who have largely been in charge of the vaccine Pop, um, production in the largest influencer in the world. They made a statement last week saying that vaccines will be distributed in the very near future, AstraZeneca vaccines, because they're not going to use it, and therefore whatever they had under their control, I think if they figure about 60 million units, something like that, would be available. It is not that they had 60 million units in a warehouse somewhere just to just deliver. It is that they controlled the production of it. But, but whatever they had in hand, we thought, well, maybe that will be available for delivery. This morning, we got probably the worst news we could have had on that because we began to think that another, another possible source was going to be available to us. This morning, the news was that something happened in the United States, in Baltimore, where the production of AstraZeneca was being done. And when the statements were being made that the American government is trying to ensure the safety of the vaccine that would become available for distribution, the AstraZeneca vaccine, the initial thought was that had to do with the expiration date because no, these vaccines have an expiration date. And if they were holding them too long, they would be getting close to the expiration date. And the thought was that they wanted to make sure that that was not the problem. What we discovered today, that is not the problem at all, is that the examination at the factory where it is being produced, confirmation still to come, is that there were contaminations of virus one, with vi with, with, uh, vaccine one with vaccine two, and the outcome of that is to have made the availability of vaccines from that supplier unacceptable until further notice and further checks.
So that has now put a, 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 another damper on the possibilities that we are anticipating. Because I don't know what the outcome of that is going to be, but that is today's report. It's not a good report for us because we were, we were literally anticipating if there was going to be this distribution of 60 million units somewhere along the line, we would have been somewhere there. And we still expect to be there, whatever. But if that scientific piece of information is confirmed, as the news is attempting to do, then it's not good news for us. I tell you all of this as background to let you know that with all that is in the conversation, the thing that is the consistent requirement is the behavior of the population in a pandemic. Dropping our guard because vaccines were coming or should come or must come. Getting tired with the virus when the virus is not getting tired with us. With us. Together. Plus some unbelievable, some unbelievable acts of irresponsibility and outright dotishness having consequences of increasing the level of infection in the country. We can do one of two things. We can say we are tired of fighting the virus by doing what has to be done. And of course, of course you know the list of things to be done, the simple things, staying very sanitary by sanitizing, by wearing the mask, by staying out of crowds, and so on, and not having this desire to congregate. That, that gregarious nature of human beings seems to be very, very strong in Trinidad and Tobago. You have to congregate. Only this morning I was hearing the chairman, the, the president of the, 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 the supermarket association saying that they are trying to act in, in, in helping the national effort but by making an intervention to discourage people from socializing in the aisles of supermarkets. And it makes you wonder, who are these people? After all that is being said and done, after the dangers that we will face and are facing, is it that this uncontrollable human desire to congregate wins out? And of course, you have to congregate and socialize and gather and lime in the aisle of the supermarket to the point where that becomes a concern now. And of course, you have to have a birthday party for little Johnny. Because Johnny is dying or he's eight or whatever it is and you've got to bring all the family together. I could tell you this afternoon, as a result of the ongoing monitoring that we have been doing of behavior of people in the country, the behavior in the homes are a major contributor to the numbers that we are seeing. Because people are still thinking that they could be smart by beating the system, being irresponsible, or just being powerful stupid. That I could do it. It's my right. And of course, as that right is exercised, you invite the family to the party or the gathering and you infect or they infect you. In some of these gatherings you have from babies to octogenarians. They must get together for somebody's event and it's happening away from public view or with public knowledge, away from the law, but it's affecting the national community. Because some people just believe, and we still do have some people who believe that COVID is a hoax, you know. We still have a lot of people who believe that we are overreacting to COVID. And to those people, I want to ask them, just spend a little time looking at what is happening in India and ask yourself, how much can one overreact before that situation? Because we still have a lot of people in this country who believe that this is all something that the government is doing to bully you and to harass you and to do what they are not seeing it in the context of life and death, maybe. Only when you are in a line to go into a ward that doesn't have a bed or a doctor or a nurse to attend to you. And heaven forbid that the basic is not available to keep you breathing. Only then will some people believe that I've put my finger in the wound and it is painful. But as leader of this country, I know 
and I told you so in the beginning, I know that there are things that have to be done to protect the lives of people in this country. And what those things are, that's my job. So today, with the numbers that we've had for a week, with all the cautions that have been out, with all the cautions we've thrown to the wind, the only thing that we could do now in Trinidad and Tobago to evade a disaster brought on by COVID-19 in its second year is to intervene and to interrupt the distribution of the virus among populations in the country wherever they might be. So, as a result of the consultations we've had, in considerations of all the things that have to be done, for all the reasons I've given and the reasons that you know, the following will be the actions of the government of Trinidad and Tobago, and we will ensure that the population is protected by these actions. One, as of midnight tonight, all restaurants and bars will be closed. Two, all malls would be closed. Three, all places of worship would be closed. All gyms and fitness centers will be closed. All spas, hairdressing locations and beauty dispensing areas will be closed to the public. Casinos and betting houses, cinemas, theaters and clubs will be closed. The public service will operate on essential service only as per the regulations and the details that were spelled out the last time out. Further details will be available tomorrow, but the public service will operate on essential service only. Tobago would be isolated as we were by limiting the amount of flights into Tobago and out of Tobago to three flights a day, and the sea bridge will operate at 25% capacity on the large on the on the ferries all tours to various areas of recreation tours whether it is to the bird sanctuary the book reef or similar places tours would end they would not be permitted and this period of this response will go until the 23rd of may There are two things I want to say associated with this action. One, as I said earlier, a number of people, and incidentally I will tell you this, some of the people who we think should lead this country at their location, at their homes, in their communities, because they are in a position to lead whether at the family level, at the community level, whether they have been the ones who have been putting themselves above the regulation. Don't apply to me. Don't apply in my neighborhood. I could organize a party because the police can't come in here and the police can't tell me what to do home. Yes, the police will be able to tell you what to do home. You see, before we took the position that we would not overly intrude on the individual freedoms even as we fight the virus. But if in so doing, persons are using that to misbehave and to create situations that threaten the rest of the country, then I want to let the country know that the existing laws and regulations of Trinidad and Tobago have been properly advised by lawyers who have been properly trained. And the advice that I have is that the existing laws and the Public Health Act and the regulations that flow from there allow the police to intervene in private spaces if the police is duly of the opinion that what is going on in that private space is detrimental to the public interest with respect to this public health emergency. The laws exist for that and the police will be so advised and guided and therefore you will not be allowed 
to do with impunity what was happening in spreading this virus behind your own wall or in your private space because you believe that it doesn't apply to you and the common sense of not doing it doesn't apply to you. And there are penalties that go with that. So I expect that there will be greater observation of the request and demand that house parties, family gatherings, liming by a house next to a bar and those kinds of things that the already overworked police will go one step further and where they believe that the activities taking place which are inimical to the public interest that under the protection of the existing law the police will intervene. With respect to vaccination, as I said earlier on, we would love to vaccinate the whole country, all those who want to be vaccinated. I want to thank the health department for the job that they've done so far in using the few tens of thousands of vaccines that we've had. There are those who make a conversation every day of pointing out to you that we've only got approximately 80,000 vaccines and we need a million. You could say it a million times. The bottom line is the vaccines are not available. If vaccines were available, we would have purchased what we required since they were available. There is no vaccine in the commercial trade in the world to say you could order, buy, even through middlemen. If the middlemen are authorized. Middlemen aren't even authorized. Agents aren't even authorized. The only way vaccines are moving from factory to arm is from the manufacturer through some government and to populations. And those governments that control that do so to their own benefit. And we haven't got to the place yet where they have been satisfied so as to allow others to feed. That's a fact. I don't know of a single CARICOM country that has been able to go through normal commerce and buy a dose of vaccine. We've all got some vaccine, a whole lot less than we anticipated, through the COVAX mechanism, which we paid into earlier. The problem that we are having is that that COVAX mechanism into which some of the produced vaccines should have gone has not been receiving anywhere near what they should have been receiving to satisfy countries like ours. Because the bigger, more powerful, richer countries have taken the supply onto themselves. These are the times we live in. And we just have to, there's no, there's no substitute for it. It's not something we could make here. It's not something we could go to a court and demand that a certain attitude change. No. It's, we are literally at the mercy of the international, not even the international marketplace, at the international management of this palliative in a pandemic. We talked a lot about it before, that it would be a bad thing if this is how it turned out to be. That's how the COVAX came into being. The creation of the COVAX mechanism was an anticipation that this kind of behavior would not take place. Unfortunately, COVAX or no COVAX, this is what it is. So we are still expecting to get a second tranche. I have, I have been regularly in touch with the WHO outside of the Ministry of Health's um, regular contact with PAHO. We have confirmation that we are to expect another similar um, batch coming to us during the month of May. We accept those confirmations, those words of confirmation. I understand that um, the Ministry of Health advised me that they did get more than just words. They got some documentation of that shipment. But even there, there are problems. I mentioned to you a while ago what we heard about the production of the vaccine and how negative that news is. Now, Ministry of Health tells me our first shipment came to us by way of Korea, from Korea. The second shipment is due to come to us by the shipment documentation by way of Italy. I'm not sure at this point in time whether they were produced in Italy or whether they have to be passing through Italy. However, as I speak to you now, we're not sure if the Italian embargo on the export of vaccine is going to affect ours, which are threaded through Italy. So 
maybe a little bit later on, the Ministry of Health will tell us what the final position is there. But we do have confirmation of a shipment that is to be on its way to us by way of Italy. So it uh, isn't an easy day. is isn't an easy issue. Isn't it? isn't an easy moment. Even that, un until we have it in our hand, we don't have it. But in anticipation of getting that, I have today um, agreed with the Ministry of Health that we are holding in our hands now about 38,000 doses of vaccines that we were holding in the event that no more was coming to us in the very near future, and that would have been used to be the second dose on those persons who were vaccinated. We've taken a decision today that we will use those vaccines as first dose application for persons who are to be vaccinated. Having taken that decision, what is the worst that could happen? The worst that could happen is that the second tranche does not get here, which means that all the 80 odd thousand who we have vaccinated would only have got one dose. The worst case is that one dose is a lot better than no dose. Because with only one dose, the science has shown that you get about a 65% protection on the second dose that goes up to about 90% or thereabouts. So if we do not get, for whatever reason, on time, the next shipment, we would have vaccinated one dose per person with upwards of 80,000 people. If, on the other hand, things go as we are expecting to go in the context of the shipment order that we have in hand, then we should get another batch in time to begin to do second dose on the first set of people that we vaccinated and then we'll be back on schedule. So we are just having to do the best we can with what's available to us. But instead of having only one batch of people with the one dose and holding the rest, we will vaccinate a, wide, a broader spectrum of people. The program is going very well. I must tell you, I have had a lot of uh, commendations from people who have gone to the various sites and were coming away singing the praises of the management of the sites and the dedication and courtesy of the health staff. And we have become accustomed in the last year to our health system um, functioning in that way. So, so we want to congratulate those people. However, there is the disgruntled conversation about vaccines not being available for all those who need, but that is rooted in the availability issue. If the vaccines were available, then everybody who wanted one would have it. But in English, I've said to you, it's not available. We can't make it. We can't buy it. We can't take it in credit. We just have to wait until it comes to us by way of the COVAX arrangement or any other arrangement which um, is in the works. Because we do have some other arrangements in the works, but they have not yet delivered. You, would, you, may, you may ask me about the African Medi supply, Medical Supply Platform. That was one area that where we have a, a big order in there, but they too have not got the vaccines because they were relying very heavily on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine when in fact it was taken off the, it was taken off the certification list. And uh, so what they were supposed to get, from which we were supposed to get, that too was stymied. And we are just in line there in the event that there's a release there. We are, in, in the eyes of many people who control vaccines, which are really the, the, the Western countries of the North, we are not the highest in the totem pole, and there are other vaccines available. But there's a fundamental policy of this government which has not changed, and I don't expect it to change, and that is that we are not going to use a vaccine that has not got the clearance of the World Health Organization. Some countries have done that for reasons which they think is best in that country's best interest. They have vaccinated basically the whole population with vaccines that are either experimental or which have not been, which have not met WHO clearances and sanctions. That they could have done that, they could do that. But Trinidad and Tobago is not those countries, and we can't do that. Because I know if we do that and something goes wrong, I know what the conversation is going to be. 
and, and I know where the liabilities will be. So we are, we are a long-standing member of the WHO and PAHO, and we will rely on, as they clear products for human use, that clearance would be our basic requirement before a product will be used in Trinidad and Tobago. Some CARICOM countries have, in fact, used some of the non-WHO vaccines, and some of the reports, and you have to be careful where the reports are coming from because it's, it's also international competition. Eh? The vaccines that are available are part of international commercial competition, international diplomatic competition, and so on, and it's only WHO that we can regard as an arbiter that looks after and clears our interests in this matter. So basically, that's where we're at. Hopefully, by May 23rd, having taken this series of actions, we will influence the levels of infection to the point where these things will no longer be necessary and we can then rule ourselves out of it. Now, it may be said that here's another month that we're losing and what effect it's going to have and what effect it's going to have. But in that conversation, I only want to ask you, when you talk about the effect it's going to have, I'm trusting that you'll still be alive. But if we don't do this, what are the effects of not doing this? That is how this argument has to go. If we don't do this, what are the effects of not doing it? And tell me which is the better choice. The government's position is, difficult as this is, we, we're hoping that it's short term, but it's the best option that's available to us. We don't want to get to a situation where the level of infection is so high that the healthcare system becomes overrun. Healthcare cannot be provided. The adequate healthcare is not available. It reflects itself in an increased number of fatalities. And that is when, as we say in local parlance, all fall down. We're trying to avoid that. If you have any questions, I see Liz got the microphone first. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good afternoon, Mr. Prime Minister. Good afternoon. Welcome back. Thank you very much. At any point in time when you were infected with COVID-19, were you scared at any point? I wouldn't say I was scared. I was, I was sobered by my grandmother's admonition that if you're born to hang, you can't drown. It wasn't, I, I did everything I think I could have done to avoid the virus, I must say that. Eh? I think I was a responsible citizen as far as I was able, as far as I knew. And then I got infected. I have no idea how and when I got, how and when I got infected. But I knew I was living in an era of a pandemic. And I was sobered by the fact that I was infected by a virus which has killed three million people in America close to us, 540 odd thousand people died from it. So this is not something to be dismissed. It will, it will keep you awake. And you're hoping that you're one of those who were able to have it and come out alive. And thankfully, I am one of those. With these new lockdown measures um, you have announced today, some persons, as some members of the public are asking, so where are we getting the money from? Some persons are blaming you, Honorable Prime Minister, for the, the, the current COVID-19 spread throughout the country. What's your view on that? Well, I, I heard the opposition leader blaming me for allowing the virus to come into the country. And I'm, anybody who wants to blame me I take that for what it is. There are very many people, <laughs> you know, I have an Irish friend who was in Trinidad for a long time when she was studying at the University of the West Indies. And she always told me she found this amazing thing in Trinidad and Tobago. And it was how people here blame inanimate objects for doing things that the humans have done. So it's never I dropped the glass and broke it. It's that the glass fall. It's never that, you know, you hit your head on the wall, that, you know, 
the wall was there and look what it do to me. So we always have to have somebody to blame. So those people are alive and well. To look at the world in this pandemic and try to blame me for what is happening in Trinidad and Tobago, I would say that that is not anything I will take very seriously. And secondly, most of the people who, will, who you're hearing, experts now trying to blame me, the government, the Ministry of Health and so on, they are the people who in the beginning was telling us that this is nonsense and that we were overreacting. Don't close the bars, don't close the border, don't do this, don't do that. When we spoke about our parallel health system, oh, nonsense. So we take that every day. You know, we, we get that every day. Some people see opportunity in those inane conversations. I see if we keep trying to blame and not focus on where the problem really is, the problem can only get worse. Fortunately, in Trinidad and Tobago at this time, there's a government that is not prepared to blame people without acting. We have identified where some of the problem lies. It's a multi-pronged problem. No one situation is contributing here. It's every situation that's contributing. The people who are going bar hopping, the people who are hiding to throw parties and having, organizing it in secret, the people who believe that they can outsmart the police even when you make it um, mandatory to wear, to, wear the, to wear the mask and so on. We, we are all there, either making our contributions or not making it. So the blame game is, I don't know who's going to benefit from that. I'll tell you one thing, it's not going to steer the government away from making the sensible, hard decisions that we have to make to stay alive. I know that you, you announced and you, you stated that bars and restaurants will be closed. Some persons are asking online, what about street food in terms of doubles and, you know? Well, we have left that there for the time being, hoping that street food, obviously, if you're gathering at street food, you're doing so in the eyes of the police and they might have to intervene if you don't stay. If you can stand in line, masked and separated, we allow those to continue. But what we try to do, we try to reduce the number of people who are interacting out there and taking into account also survival of those who are out there. Just one more question before I, I hand over the mic. In terms of border, the border closure, the continued border closure, some persons are asking, do you think that measures need to change in terms of the exemption process as some nationals, we have been told, are selling bottles and cans abroad to stay afloat. Well, what I could say to that, though, is that we were just, at, just as a matter of fact, we were just at the stage of beginning to craft the policy that will allow the removal of the exemption because we believe that there were enough people who would have been vaccinated abroad and we could have put conditions on, of entry where your status would have allowed us to open the border in some way to certain categories of people who had to be in a certain condition. But just as we were doing that, this situation developed. So we can't be talking now about this in the context of the next two or three weeks. But certainly we, we, we think that we are, as, and as we get more vaccinated, and as the vaccination is more successful outside, the opening of the border becomes more and more of a possibility in the not too distant future. Providing, providing that we don't get reversals, not just here in Trinidad and Tobago, but outside. Because there are some variants outside which have overturned people's uh, expectations out there. So even as you vaccinate, there are possibilities, but we play, we, we, we'll cross those bridges as we come to them. It was about well, three weeks ago, two, just about two to three weeks ago, I would say, that the Minister of Health and myself, we were discussing what are the parameters we would use now to allow people to come in without an exemption policy, but a policy of entry that would be determined by your condition coming in. You know, we had the PCR test, now we could add other things to that and allow people to come based on that. But of course, you know, there's, there, there, there's another argument to that, that there's no such thing that ought to happen, like a, a vaccine passport. But of course, that is not anything new. 
I mean, those of us who travel would know that before COVID, to go to certain countries, you had to have a certain level of vaccination. Here in our own country, while children are, are protected by having a right to go to school, but you have to be vaccinated for certain diseases to come to the school. Some parents will keep their children away from school for that purpose. Hope, I mean, hopefully only very, very few. But vaccination has been seen to be a, a, a way that we have been responding to microbes before. And certainly, if the situation warranted lifting of the border controls, then we could do that. But this immediate situation will attract our attention before we get to that. Camille McKechnie, Guardian Media. Um, earlier on, way earlier on, when we started being affected by the virus, you indicated that if you had a similar lockdown, there won't be any money in the coffers or people in bars and that kind of thing. Is the situation still the same? Let me, let me repeat that because a lot of people will quote me. What I said is that we will not be in a position to be as helpful as we were in the beginning because the money is just not there. And in, when we did intervene last year, March and April, we told you where the money came from. A lot of it was borrowed money. We borrowed money to fight the virus at that stage. We came through the year 2020 doing reasonably well, doing good. But then 2021, whatever we have done, whatever has been done to us, we are now called upon again. What I was saying is that don't be irresponsible thinking that, well, nothing will happen that we can't deal with in our stride. It will be a serious challenge. Because as we make these decisions today, the Minister of Finance is going to have to look now to see, one, first and foremost, that we are able to preserve the social support system that we have in place. This country has a very large social support system in place, and that is not taken into account at all when people speak about helping people. During, the, during last 2020, as a matter of fact, only recently the Minister of Finance and I were looking at the, the expansion of expenditure that took place in the Ministry of Social Development. Because all, that, all of the help that we hear, we give this and give that and give this and give that, it turns up in the bottom line into millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. So we do not have the resources now to be as helpful as we are, as we were last year. And therefore, this kind of situation we know is another situation of pain for persons who will try to help how far we can go, I couldn't say just yet, but we certainly do not have the amount of resources we had last year because we did have some resources in hand and we did borrow considerably. You may recall that when we started out responding to this virus, initially, it looked like a three-month assignment. We were talking about May month, and then we were looking at the horizon of September, and then we very, in low voices, talk about, well, to end of the year. But of course, we are, in, we are now what? Into, we are almost into May of 2021, and the situation is still as aggressively with us. And we have seen many, many areas around the world where we thought that they had got past the virus, only to see that the scientific warning was correct, that whenever you have a resurgence of the, resurgence of the virus, it tends to be worse in the second and third phases. That is what history has shown. And we are seeing it in some countries around now. And we are another country. Trinidad and Tobago, I know we like to look inwards and look and try and play different. We are another country who will not condemn the findings of the science that if this thing comes back to you, it, makes a, it meets a weakened population and therefore has a better chance of infecting the population that has had a first pass, where some people didn't fall, but they were weakened in one way or the other. I mean, a simple thing like diet. If a lot of people in the country are not being fed well and they're hungry, and the second round of the virus comes, don't you think that well-fed people are better able to cope than the ones who are struggling for food? And that is what happens. So we have to be very careful that we don't encourage returns. And when we take these actions, we know well, some of the actions here don't have a, a dollar value to it. It has an emotional value. I mean, we hate to want to um, close the churches and the mosques and the mandirs and so on. But... Without a dollar value there, we know there's a, there's a spiritual value in that. 
And then, of course, the, 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 the business places, we know what's going to happen. But we also know what is going to happen if we don't do it. We could shift all of this from the bars and the restaurants and the churches. We could shift all, you know, to the hospital and to the morgues and to the graveyard. Understand? So the choice we are making, difficult as it is, we are making the choice to avoid shifting the activity or the outcome to the wards. I mean, you understand what's happening. We've had our nurses and doctors working non-stop for a year, 24 hours a day. When I was in Tobago, well, I'm still in Tobago. <laughs> While I was in Tobago, one of the instructions that came to my caregivers here was that I ought to have, because of the risk, especially in the first few days, when I was obse being observed to see what was going to happen in response to the, the virus that I had in my body, that when I'm the Prime Minister, I presume it had to do because I was the Prime Minister. I'm still the Prime Minister. But the, 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 the protocols that call for an ambulance and a doctor and a nurse to be assigned to me. And I said, you know, to be how many ambulances? What? Some, a few, a few. You take one and you assign one to me. That's one gone. And a driver has to be there. That's, that's three shifts. And a doctor, that's three shifts. Is that three doctors or one doctor working three shifts? So at, at work, two doctors. And then, of course, a nurse. So I said, you know what? Good as that sound in terms of managing prime ministerial calamity, we're not going to do that. Right? I will tell you if I feel any way uncomfortable or unwell. And it will take enough time, hopefully, to get from Bleming to Signal Hill. And we save a lot of money doing that. But very many people around the world didn't make that trip. Because one of the things that is happening when you're having home quarantine is that a lot of people only come out to seek medical attention when they are very ill. By that time, it is too late to intervene. You understand? It's a, it's a very delicate, delicate balance. If you, if you don't come out in time to seek medical attention, when you do come out because the condition has become such that you can't ignore it and that you are now in grave danger, sometimes you don't make the trip. In terms of celebration of Eid, what kind of advice are in you In terms giving? of what? Celebration of Eid. Eid. And in addition to that, people, students who are now going to school for exam purposes, what, what, what are you going to advise? Well, we have, we have taken the position that we will still have the children go to school to try to finish for the exams that are just around the corner. And hopefully they will appreciate that and the parents will appreciate that and get them to finish their exams because to not finish the exam is another kind of problem. And so we please cooperate with our children, whether you are in transportation, whether you are whatever. They'll come out, they are almost there to do the exams and finish the school year. So in the, some, in the things that we have done, some of it is to allow them to do that. And the other point you raised was Eid. Eid. Well, all I will say to that, the Muslim community has been very understanding of what the government has said when we reduced the numbers going to the mosque. Now, given what they would have seen, what I have seen, what you have seen, what, we will come to the conclusion that in 2021, for a part of Ramadan, we had to stay away and stay with family. And of course, we are asking, don't mix families. You would have heard that before. And the reason being, we don't want cross infections. So this will be either the difference that we stay away for the rest of it and, and, and the actual celebration of Eid at Eid, which will fall is, is the 18th of May? Yeah. So 8th of May. Yes, it will fall in, in this period of, 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 of um, restriction. It's just to keep it as family as possible and without congregation. Allah will understand. Like she's going to give me a chance, it seems. Sorry, George. <laughs> <laughs> All right.
Prime Minister, historically, we have had a good relationship with Cuba, and we have trusted Cuban medicines. There is a lot of discourse in the international arena about the Cuban vaccine. Can you envision a, a, a circumstance where we give consideration to the Cuban vaccine, um, whether another sanctioning agency looks at it? It is particularly scary, the Indian situation, where India is the largest producer of vaccines in the world, and they're not at this point able to produce enough for themselves. So that, yes, we have the policy position, but is there any possibility of taking another look at that as far as the Cuban option uh, is concerned, even if it has a lower efficacy than the vaccines that we're currently contemplating? The, uh, the problem with that, George, is, the, is not just ac accepting a Cuban vaccine or a vaccine X. It is the liability that you will take on for using a product that has not met our legal requirements. Who would take the responsibility for using a vaccine that has not been certified in a way that could stand a challenge within our legal system? If we take a vaccine from a source which is not protected by the uh, legal architecture of the WHO and the, the output of that factory certified by a, a legal certifier of that stature and somebody claims that they were paralyzed by it or the child that was born with a particular condition is as a result of the vaccine. You remember something called thalidomide? Anybody here knows, ever heard of thalidomide? Well, research it. It was a drug that was used and had wonderful recommendations and it was very effective and it had the effect of damaging a lot of children people to be born with a short arm and that kind of thing right and the, the liability that will go with that i mean we would love to have and we know that if the cuban vaccine becomes certified that our relationship with cuba is such that we know that we will be able to access it Without, without the kind of drama that we are trying to access other kinds of vaccines now. But the bottom line is, who will carry the liability for a product from that source of that nature? It seems as though to when we first went to this place just over a year ago, using maybe moral suasion or something, the Minister of Finance had made an intervention with banks and there were certain um, actions that they took. Most of those actions expired in December last. Is the, can you tell if the minister would maybe ask the banks to have another look, particularly with regard to their customers who are, are going, again, going to be affected by these shutdowns? Well, we will keep reaching out to the national community at all stations indicating that you do whatever you can because as we say we all in this together the, the people who are banking with the banks are clients of the banks and banks without clients are not real banks the banks will have an interest in protecting the lives and existence of their clients and they will do and we will keep asking them to do that and whatever we have put in place that worked if we can put them back in place again, we will try to do so if the conditions are affordable. Final question, final question, Prime Minister. And I'm glad I'm wearing a mask so you can't tell whether my tongue is in my cheek or not. Uh, there is a public consultation regarding the new THA Act that should take place on Saturday. Will that be affected by the lockdown measures, or will that go ahead? I don't think so, but it is just that it's gonna, that was meant to be heavily virtual, and I think it can still continue. No, you said there was a public meeting here on yeah. Saturday and a virtual meeting on Monday, no? Well, it's all virtual. All virtual? Yes, yes, yes. 
as many people as possible can go take part online in it. And if, 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 they, if they do, um, if they do have anybody in front of them as they speak, it will just be the minimal amount of to keep you awake and alive as you present. But the actual public coming into the conversation is going to be virtual. Yes, Dr. Rowley, Corey Connolly, Newsday. Are you particularly concerned about how these measures are likely to impact the Tobago context? As you know, Tobago has been relying heavily on domestic tourism for the past few months. How, how, would that, how do you respond to that? I could tell you that I'm very concerned about all the areas of Trinidad and Tobago. I know you are here in Tobago and you will be more familiar with and even more in, uh, empathetic with what's happening in Tobago. But I can tell you that similar or worse effects will happen in Trinidad. So it's not as if Tobago is going to be feeling the worst of it or the brunt of it or so. All over the country, these restrictions will have some negative effect. But it is, as I said, the alternative is far worse for all of us. So it's a bitter pill that we all have to swallow. On a separate issue, you lost one of your senior cabinet ministers recently, Minister Franklin Kahn. Has that experience, and given your own bout with COVID-19, has that sort of made you reflect on your own political future? Well, let me just put it this way. Uh, president Balaguer, Caribbean president, you know him, right? He's in Santo Domingo. He was 92 and blind. And he was the candidate of, of the major political party at the time. So we have some serious road to travel here. He had some um, points to clarify from persons external. Um, first up, with respect to outdoor exercising, exercising on the streets and parks and so forth, would that be affected? Um, no, we have not restricted that, but uh, especially in the context of the finding, the scientific finding of the CDC that says that being outdoor, getting outdoor air, as long as you are masked and as long as you don't congregate, is a good thing. So on this occasion, we are not restricting outdoor activity, but we are not encouraging congregation. If you are outdoor and you're in groups of more than five, you will attract the attention of the police. And if you're outdoor without your mask, then you'll attract the attention of the police. So you could be outdoor, but just bear in mind that there are conditions of being outdoor. Persons with stores that have locations in malls and locations outside of malls would like to know if the locations outside of the malls can be allowed to open. I wonder who asked a question like that. <laughs> the, the restriction on the mall mm. is for the mall. Okay. <laughs> if you have something somewhere else, then mm. clearly it's not the mall. Right. Another point for clarification. You mentioned 25% capacity on the sea bridge and a reduction to three flights per day on the air bridge. What would be the capacity on those flights and uh, what type of aircraft well, let me tell you what the capacity is the capacity is saying to you what those things are saying to you gently is unless you absolutely have to move from tobago don't move unless you absolutely have to go to tobago don't go that's what that means so we left enough space for emergencies on coming both ways 25 percent on the apt james was what's 25 percent of approximately a thousand that's about just a, about 250 people there was a time you couldn't get 20 people to turn that so you have capacity for 250 people on a trip unless it is absolutely essential we are trying to say to you tobago could be protected a bit more if we cut down the inflow into tobago and if tobago Indians don't go to trinidad right so and it's not just for Tobago. We are saying to the household, please don't encourage your family to come and visit you. 
Please don't have birthday parties to hug up your nanny and your nanny. Stay home. Stay away from people. We are in a pandemic for heaven's sake. That's what all that means. Because the ultimate bad outcome of this situation is you could lose your life. You could be hurt because a lot of people who survived the infection end up with long-term consequences. Many people didn't know that they had morbidities that, they, that could threaten their lives until they got COVID and they discovered, well, A, you know you also have B, C, and D too, right? So all we are saying, to give yourself the best chance to come out of this with the best operation, the best outcome of this is to stay alive with the virus at low level or eliminated from our community. And we are saying in very many ways, all these restrictions, it is not because we are against these businesses. It is because these activities bring people together. And we are saying in this situation, with 300 and odd people on the list today, and maybe tomorrow might be more, we can't afford for it to be more. So the activities that bring people together, we are reluctantly forced to decelerate those activities. We know there are consequences. Some people take, uh, take a pride in telling us about the consequences as if we, don't, we didn't consider that. We know that there are consequences, but the alternative is what? The worst consequence is an outcome where our health system cannot provide the health care that the population requires and the outcome is death. As it pertains to <coughs> positive cases with the new variants that we are seeing entering in the country. What's the policy position with respect to isolation of those patients? Would they be required to um, go to a medical facility or will they be allowed They're, to isolate at home? All the persons who have been identified are treated with great seriousness by the health department to minimize the opportunity for spread and they would not be allowed but on the other hand, I know that um, we heard about variants from other countries. And we also ought know that when these people found their variants, it wasn't just one person or six people. Then they discovered that that is what was raging through the country. When we first heard about the South African variant, we thought, well, okay, well, they found the variant. That might, within a matter of a week or two, the decision was taken in South Africa not to use a particular vaccine because it was not very effective because the bulk of the people, same thing happened in England. After they found the variant, then they discovered that a whole lot of people, we in Trinidad and Tobago found the variant. As of now, we don't know how many people in our country have the variant. We could make some serious um, non-scientific conclusions. When the first person with the variant was found, it was a an immigrant from, from Venezuela, I think. But it was easy, easy to say that he, was, he brought it in. I heard people saying that. But that is not a solid conclusion. He could easily have picked it up in Trinidad and Tobago because we picked up many other people with it. We right now, we don't know how much it has spread among us. What we do know is that the variant is far more virulent than the original COVID-19 virus. And it is to be avoided at all costs. And we are doing that as far as we are. You, you, you hear people, very many people who don't even know what the South Coast is or what it looks like, keep talking about the porous border, the porous border. We are doing everything possible on both sides of the border. Here and, and, in, in, and in Venezuela, you have seen authorities in, in, in Venezuela saying how many people that they have stopped in Venezuela from trying to leave illegally to go to Trinidad and Tobago. You've seen people killing themselves in the sea doing that. And of course, it's happening at night. For those of you who ever been on the water at night, it's just one black area. And they rush to the, sea, they rush to the border. And of course, there are locals in Trinidad and Tobago who are running a trade in people. There are locals in Trinidad and Tobago running a trade either in transporting them. There's a fee for transporting them across the water 
is only, a, in some cases, an hour and a half. And there are people who bring them here for their use and purpose in many ways. So they are not helping us fight this virus. Many of them who bring in them here for that purpose are the ones in front talking about migrants. And frankly, I would take pleasure in seeing them in the hands of the police and exposed for the business that they're involved in. Because many of them out front making an issue about migrants and as fast as the government tries to respond, they find ways around it. There are those who talk as though you could take a galvanized fence and build a galvanized fence all the way around the South Coast and around plant shares. It doesn't go like that. The only the only border in the world that we know people don't try to go through is North Korea. Every other border in every country, there are people trying to come through because it's not logistically possible to put a chicken wire fence around your country. And even if you do, they'll come with a pliers. And the one person that I don't want to hear telling me anything about border is Kamala Posad Bissessa and the UNC. Because this problem of Venezuelans didn't start under this government. We are the ones who stopped it. We are the ones who said no to it, no more. We are the ones who put them on visa. We are the ones who repatriated some of them. We are the ones who got the Coast Guard to be aggressive in the Gulf. But as you go through the serpent's mouth, you come along, around to Bayaro, to the Atlantic Ocean, all the way to Tobago, you would have seen them. It's a problem that is not just a light to turn on or you turn off. It's constant vigilance. And the Coast Guard is doing a job. Those Coast Guard officers are out there. And it must be very painful for them to be hearing these comments as though, well, they're not doing the job and they're just allowing people to come in because they're border porous. They are out there. How do you think they find them so often? It's because they're out there. So those who created this environment and telling us about looking after the border, yes, we are looking after the border. If we had it in the beginning, proper patrols out there in the beginning, that attraction that Trinidad and Tobago became, for Venezuelans may never have happened. They would have known that we had vessels out there that could stay there and see them when they come. But we didn't want those vessels. We allowed the Brazilians to have them. This government taking action, and in the very near future, our first Coast Guard patrol vessel for that purpose will be here in Trinidad and Tobago because we had to go and look for money to find it. We had to order it. We had to build it. And it's almost there. Both of them almost there. They were held up by, by, the, by, the, by the covid that affected the shipyard, like the, the, the ferries were. But thankfully, the work has progressed considerably, and those vessels are not too far away. So I don't want to hear nothing from the opposition on this particular matter about borders. Because half of them is them and their friends. Half of the horses in this country is them bringing in people to make money there. My, my final question takes us across the border, <laughs> and it treats with a matter that you have been following using both your scientific and your political hats. We've seen what happened in the past 12 hours also in particular in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So as it pertains to our servicemen and women over there, are we likely to see them having an extended tour of duty? Will we be sending additional manpower to assist in that respect? Um, what, what's going to happen with them? Well, at the time when they went, um, it was clear that they were needed. The government asked for that help, and they were there. We said two weeks in the first instance at the last assessment. Um, given what is happening with the volcano and um, the government, uh, we determined that they would take a decision to begin to come back home very soon, unless the situation worsens. So I expect that very soon we'll begin to get them back home if the volcano continues where it's at at the moment. But volcanoes are very unpredictable. But um, we've done this many times before, so it shouldn't really be a problem for us. We've done it in Dominica, in Montserrat, in St. Vincent. So we expect that they'll come back home very soon. Because that, that early period when things were in disarray, helping the government to preserve security until it gets into a routine is what you went there for. Prime Minister, um, Liz Williams again, TV6 News. Just have some more questions here that has come in online. I know we have to wrap up a bit, but um, 
some persons are asking about the NLCB online gaming. The is, what? <laughs> they're asking about NLCB online gaming. Is that going to continue? Persons can still go and collect on buy purchase tickets. Persons I, are also asking about sporting activities. Can national teams continue to train? What we didn't say was affected, remain unaffected. Okay. So and, um, uh, the, the training, uh, we, didn't say, we didn't say that we stopped national teams from training. Mm -hmm. There was an exemption granted there, so we expect that that will continue. As for NLCB, I think, I think that, that people will still be able to play their games. I'm, I, I don't know that we've said no, no to that. But even if you're doing that, if you're going to a vendor to buy a lottery ticket, the key is not buying the ticket. The key is don't congregate. Be sure that the vendor could still be on the pavement selling the ticket, or you could go by the window. But when you get by the window, you mustn't be there more than five people. And if, if you're there, don't be in people's faces. And of course, you'll be wearing your mask when you order your dog and your cat and your cow and your crazy man and whatever you order at the, at the window. All right. But in terms of now funerals, some persons are saying, okay, you said that there's the closure of churches, but what about funerals? Um, where will the, this the funeral regulations already they remain in place. I mean, and persons are also asking weddings in terms of weddings. Those, those regulations are spelled out in place, mm -hmm. and there are some people who believe that they don't apply to them. There's one particular graveyard here in Tobago that insists on having a crowd around the, around the graveyard. The police has been informed to pick you up in your funeral clothes. <laughs> yeah, you know who you are. Going back to food outlets, restaurants, um, persons are asking about drive through um, KFC, Burger King, McDonald's, are the drive throughs they could still be open? There are restaurants and they are closed. What about the survival of Caribbean Airlines? Because I know that Caribbean Airlines, it's a tough time for the airline and I've been hearing that they are on the verge of shutting down, I'm not sure, but they are in a, in a budgetary constraint at this point. That is true, and the Minister of Finance has provided significant help, but the, the longer it stays, the more difficult it becomes. But interestingly, the, 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 the ray of light had just begun. What I was saying early on, the ray of light was just appearing for Caribbean Airlines as we were talking about allowing some relief on the traffic through the border. Because if people who are vaccinated and can have a PCR test are now allowed to move as a category of person, then Caribbean Airlines business then would have been restarted. Oh, this morning I was talking to somebody in New York who told me they couldn't get a seat on the flight that's coming out of New York. And I do know that there are people who want to come home, and once they're in the condition to come in, and we are able to receive them without the dangers that we had before, then we are on the verge of making that transition. But unfortunately, we have this kind of development to deal with now. But um, we are, in fact, looking at that situation to see how people can come in in a way now that they couldn't come in last year um, at this time. Because we do have a large population of people now who are out there who can claim to have a better response to the virus. And that, will, that is where Caribbean Airlines business will be restarted. Thank you all very much. Sir, sir, sir just before you go, right? You'll read that, you that all night, you know. Okay. <laughs> Last question. <laughs> what advice are you giving to the private sector? The private sector? Yes. The advice I could give to the private sector is, first and foremost, remember that you are a private sector in a pandemic. Stay alive. In do whatever you have people, to do to stay alive. In terms of people going to work. If you notice, much, of, much of what we have done, we've left the private sector um, as much as we can. We took a lot of the government sector out. That large amount of public servants we say who are non-essential, um, that's the government. But some of the private sector activities that attract people, we have had to close them. For, let's look at it. If we all do what we think we can do for the next three weeks, then we could get back to a place where we can sustain and grow. But if we don't do it, the same private sector is going to collapse. Because if the workers are sick, the hospitals are unable to cope, then there's no private sector betterment. Okay? 
It's just a period of hardship that we are going to go through, but we will survive. Right. Thank you all very much. Just now, before you go, I, sorry, before you go, some persons are also asking, you said that restaurants and bars will close, but some restaurants have been doing deliveries. Is it that deliveries will also stop? We, for the moment, we are closing the operations because we are stopping the movement of people. It is not the business that we're after. It is the movement and involvement of people, and we are encouraging people to stay home for this period. Stay away from other people for this period. We want to break the, tra the chain of transmission from person to person. So during this period, instead of ordering your lunch and going to pick it up and meet people and pass, eat a sandwich home sometimes. Because what we want, what we really want, is to break the opportunity for the virus to go from person to person. To do that, you have to isolate. And I could tell you about isolation. Thank you very much. That was a live press conference by Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley from Tobago. Remember, you can join us for more on matters coming out of the press conference, as well as the latest stories on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter at GTT Live Online. to be released. Sherwin Gardner is excited to invite you to the Pointed Up Virtual Album Launch. This is your boy Sherwin Gardner and I'm excited that I will be live this 